Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. Ushers here that's gonna be a couple of them up front and a couple in the middle there. And if you just come up the aisle, why we'll all uh, we'll all get our um, our cups and our bread uh, in order. <laughs> so we got some ushers coming here. Man, praise God! <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead and start coming. back you know of course this bread represents the body of Christ and we have these cups that represent the blood of Christ I mean I was thinking there was a statement that Jesus made to his disciples I, I believe he's talking 2,000 years ahead to us uh, during the Last Supper and and he said do this often in remembrance of me and uh, you know of course his disciples I mean they didn't know they didn't understand what was going to happen next. You know, Jesus was going to be crucified and, and raised from the dead. But, uh, of course, we do. But, but when he said, do this often, often in remembrance of me. You know, this bread that represents the body of Christ. You know, in Jesus Christ's body, why, he took on all the, all the things that would challenge us in life. And, and he took them on himself. And he won. So, so it's, it's like for you and I, you know, uh, we're... And uh, if life was a game, we've already won the game. This, this is fixed. <laughs> you know, if we just stay in the game, we're gonna, we've already won. The, the only way you can lose is if you step out and disqualify, you know, because you stepped out. But, but he took every challenge on himself. Just think, you know, uh, on Jesus' body, he was whipped, so we were healed. Uh, he was stripped naked with nothing, and we were made rich. You know, he was, he, he was bruised so we could have peace. He, he was chastised so we'd never have grief in our life. Um, he spent three days burning in torment in hell so that we'd never have fear and that God could come and live right inside of us. You know, that's something, isn't it? That, that here you're in Christ and the Spirit of God is actually living inside you. you. You can't tell where you begin and God ends or you end or God begins because you're one. I mean, we, Jesus won the game for us. But you know, I think the reason he said to do this often in remembrance of him, you know, it, it, it's our practice here. We do like the first Sunday of each month, we receive communion together as a church family. But boy, it's good to take communion like on your own. Like, like Jesus said, often. 
Well, you, you probably, uh, you're probably a lot more mature than me, but I got to take communion like every day. And the reason why is this, because circumstances speak. And what they say is that we've not went won. They, they want to tell us to forget the fact that Jesus won every challenge for us. Man, you know, it's a lot of fun to play when you already have won. I think back years ago when I was in sports, if I would have known ahead of time that I'd won the game, I would have been a lot more creative. I would have had a lot more fun playing, I'll tell you that. And that's the way it is for us. We've already won because Jesus took every challenge on himself and overcame on our behalf. So as long as we just don't quit and we remember that, we stay in the game, why we won. So let's, uh, so let's eat this together knowing that, that each one of us is a winner. You know, there's some people in here that are probably facing challenges right today. And, you know, that's what we got this blood for. Because, uh, you know, something else that circumstances say is that, well, you know, God came through last time. But you never know what he's going to do with this one. Or this, or this circumstance, this issue, this is too big for God. Man, let's just laugh at that. <laughs> God's bigger than... So this blood shouts that no, God works all the time, every time, all the time. We won. We won. This is the guarantee. So let's take this together. And you know, with these truths in mind, it should just change the way we look at life. It should change the way we live. You know, you know like I said, if you already know ahead of time that you've won the deal, Boy, we can have a lot of fun with this in the midst of the thing. <laughs> it's like, it might look right now like you're falling behind, but what does it matter if it's the end of the third quarter and you got zero and the other team's got 28? If you're Tom Brady, you still win the Super Bowl. That's what, It's already won for us. That's what I'm saying today. So that, uh, we're going to worship some more. I invite you to join in. Let's just sing out this third verse one more time. <clears throat> of creation you chased down my heart through all of my failure in pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die but as you see A hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so alive I can see your heart in everything you've done Amount to your desire. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Thank you, Jesus. line in that song where it talked about Jesus lost his life so we could find life. Wow. 
that, that's the way it is for us. We found life. Man, let's make the most of it. Oh, I don't waste one minute of your day with regret. One minute thinking things aren't going to work out. Man, Jesus gave his life, so you got his life. You're actually, we're living his life right now. Man, that's a whole nother take on things, isn't it? Praise God. Well, why don't you greet your neighbor here, and we're going to move on in our service. Praise God. That was awesome. Hallelujah. God's good to us. Um, I want to receive the offering. If the ushers could please help me. I think they might have some communication cards. Or do we have those, Linda? Or don't we have? Okay, just the offering envelopes. Uh, if you're giving cash and would like a receipt, just slip your hand up. One of these ushers will give you an offering envelope. If you make it out a check, you can make it out to Destiny Church. Praise God. Isn't it awesome, wonderful to be able to give and to be a blessing? Thank God that we live in this country that, that we live in. And uh, we can experience freedom and, and uh, things. I remember I heard a guy say one time that America was the first country that crawled its way out of the despair and the brokenness of, of, of the world and developed a, a society that was based on freedom and personal rights and then because of what we did, America did, the Founding Fathers, then other countries followed. But we were the beacon of light that started it. And thank God for it. And you live in that country. Yes. Amen. So uh, go ahead, pass your offering buckets, everybody. I just want to mention to you that um, we kind of switched things up a little bit with the children. Um, the children have their own worship team now. And so they'll be going right to the, when you come on Sunday morning, you'll be going right, the children will be going right to um, the children's area. Of course, if you don't want them to go, that's up to you, but um, they will be ready for them, I'm trying to say, uh, right away. And then, um, uh, then after the service, I'll be, when I close the service, then um, there'll be a period of time where your children will be entertained and back there until 12 noon. And uh, so if you want to go get them, go, you can go get them. You can go get them anytime you want. But I'm just saying that they're going to be uh, supervised till 12 noon. At 12 noon, they are yours. And so <laughs> they jump off the roof. That's on you. I mean, I'm just telling you that at 12 noon, they are yours. But if you want to go get them anytime before that, you're sure welcome to. I'm just trying to say. And we're having refreshments. They are having refreshments and we're having refreshments and so I just want you to know, that's a little change that we made this Sunday. And uh, we're going to see how it works. And we're open to changing to something else. But we're going to try this, see how it works. But um, there's a lot of good uh, entertainment for the kids. I want you to stand with me before I go into the message. And I want us to pray for our nation. Uh, someone mentioned to me, actually two people mentioned to me that uh, President Trump uh, signed a uh, petition or sign something, the proclamation that today was a national day of prayer. And we definitely want to pray for our nation. You know, this is something the Bible teaches us in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul said, I exhort that first of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then he specifies for kings and all that are in authority. We don't have a king, we have a president, but we have people in authority. We need to pray for them. He said that you may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's what Paul said. And so I want us to pray to get today for our nation. Will you agree with me? Maybe you want to grab somebody by the hand just to agree with them. Lord, we just thank you that according to your word, you told us that if we pray for our nation, the leaders of our nation, that we will lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So right now, Lord, according to your word and obedience to the scriptures, we pray for our president. We pray for the leaders of our nation, the Congress, the, the House of Representatives, the Senate, Lord. We pray right now for the judicial branch, Lord. We just pray, God, that your wisdom, your protection, 
uh, your knowledge, your abilities would be upon each and every single one of them, Lord. We pray, God, that you would root out every uh, form of evil and, and, and things that cause destruction in our land. We pray, God, that you give us godly policies, those that lift humanity up. We just pray, Lord, for a, a great awakening to come to this nation, Lord. Hallelujah. We pray for those that are in Texas, Louisiana, in the South, Lord, that are suffering with this hurricane, Lord. We just pray, God, right now that you bring rescue, that bring peace, Lord, that you make uh, certain connections, God, that people will get the help that they need. And Lord, we just pray for our nation. We thank you that we have this privilege of living in this great land, Lord. We pray, God, your hand be upon it now. And we agree together in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Everybody agree? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I titled this message, Get Up, Pack Up, and Get Moving. How do you like that? And I'm not talking about you moving somewhere, but I'm talking about you spiritually moving into the things of God. But get up, pack up, and get moving. I don't know if I've ever preached on this passage. And someone goes, well, did you get this while you were praying? No, actually, I was on the lawnmower, but I was praying. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with mowing lawn, but I was on the lawnmower. And this story came to my mind. I thought, well, that's strange. I wasn't reading that passage this week or I haven't heard a sermon on it. And so I was kind of surprised. So I started to look at it and I felt like God began to speak to me out of this passage. And so I'm going to give it to you. This morning in verse two, it says in Mark five. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Beth Esda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, some of your translations don't have this next verse, but I'll read it anyways. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made whole of whatever disease he had. Didn't matter what it was. He was made whole. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That's a long time. 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise. This is where I get my title. Rise or get up, take up your bed, pack up and walk, get moving. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, walk. And the same day was the Sabbath. It's interesting here that this story, the word Beth, Bethesda comes from two words. It means Beth, which means house, and Esda, which means mercy, a house of mercy. There's a lot of Beths in the Bible. Beth, Bethany, Bethel, Bethlehem, Bethsaida, a lot of Beths. The Beth word means house, and then there's an a, a, a ending to it. And so whatever the ending means, it means house of, like Bethel means house of God, El being Elohim, short version of Elohim, so it's house of God. Bethlehem is house of bread, Beth, house, Lahem, bread, house of bread. So if you look through the Bible, you'll see a lot of Beths. So in this case, Bethesda means house of mercy. And it was a place in Jerusalem where the mercy of God was put on display. The grace of God was put on display. Around this pool, there were five porches, the Bible says, that was full of sick people. Full of sick people. In fact, the Bible says it was a great multitude. If you have a great multitude, you have thousands of people. I want you to try and picture this in your mind, a pool that's not that big. And all around this pool, there's porches. They're like arbors, covered porches. And in the, under these porches are all these multitude people, and they're all sick, very sick, suffering. Just imagine the noise. Just imagine the noise from suffering people. The cries of pain, the anguish, and the calls for help. 
I mean, if you walked in there, you get thousands of people that are in pain, that are suffering. You walked into that area, you would hear a roar of people crying out. You'd smell things you probably never wanted to smell again the rest of your life. But these people were suffering. And I believe in a lot of ways that this is a picture of humanity. How many know that people can walk into a room and they can look really good on the outside, but inside they can be in so much pain and so much suffering? Sometimes if we see somebody walking and, and they limp or something, we go, they must be in pain. They must be in suffering. And so we go, we can see that suffering. But a lot of times you can't see suffering that people have inside. I mean, there's a suffering that's inside that's far worse sometimes than suffering that's outside. I mean, I've and I'm sure everyone here has experienced a, a time of pain or suffering. My uh, oldest son is a was a twin uh, Joe was a twin. His brother, Benjamin, died after he was less than a year old. And after he died, I came to this conclusion. I didn't know a human could suffer or hurt that much. That's how I felt. I didn't know a human could hurt that much. And that's how people experience things. Stuff happens in our lives and we just feel so affected by it. I mean, we're just in agony. We're in suffering because of it. And I believe that's a picture of these five porches. These people have together, and you can imagine, you know, when you're around people that are all suffering, uh, people that are suffering together, you know, they, they actually usually don't have a lot of good advice for the other person that's suffering. They, they go, I'm suffering, I'm suffering. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what's your advice? I don't have any, I mean, they don't usually have a lot of good advice. And I thought about this, you know, like um, the Bible talks about the troubling of the water. You know, it's a good thing to be troubled. There's a good trouble and there's a bad trouble. How many know that's true? There's a bad trouble and there's a good trouble. Sometimes you have to trouble yourself. And I know what you're looking at me like going, what, are you out of your mind? But when I first got saved, I got spirit, you know, I got spirit filled. And I worked at the Billy Graham Association. And they're wonderful people. And I, I love Billy Graham, believe in him 100%. But they didn't have the same experience with the Holy Spirit that I had. And so when we started to talk about it, I found out that they didn't believe like I believed. And so I was troubled by what they said. And they were, in fact, they give me articles. Some of them, they said that, you know, my experience was of the devil. And I told one of them, I said, you know, you're trying to talk me out of a Bible experience. You realize that, don't you? The Bible teaches what I got. And, um, but I was troubled by what they said. But you know what, that was a good troubled. Because it made me, it made me study scripture. It made me dig in. It made me get understanding. And sometimes if we're too comfortable and we're too uh, at ease, we need to get troubled enough so that we seek the things of God. How many know that's true? So there's actually a good trouble. In other words, uh, if you're always around people that believe like you, uh, it doesn't challenge you to dig in. But when you encounter somebody that doesn't believe like you, sometimes it, it, you get troubled and you've got to dig in. And, and that's why, you know, they say that they have that term birds of a feather flock together. And that's the problem is dysfunctional people flock together. And sometimes you've got to be around people that aren't like you, that challenge you, that in a sense trouble you so that you'll do something. Because the miracle of healing happened when the angel troubled the water. And something will happen to you spiritually when you're in a situation where you're being troubled. I hope you got troubled this morning. But I hope it's a good trouble. You might walk in here and go, what was that all about? I hope you got troubled this morning, but I hope it was a good trouble. You got stirred up. The Bible says stir up the gift of God. That is a good trouble. And we need to be in a place where we're in a good trouble. You know, I, I try to read, I try to read two books a month. I listen to, you know, I listen to probably 30 sermons a, um, or more a month. And I please read my Bible and I pray. You say, why do you do that? I'm trying to trouble myself. I'm trying to gain. I'm trying to increase. I'm not content with where I'm at. I want somebody, I want to read something which would challenge my thinking and challenge my lifestyle and cause me to press on into God. Amen. And the problem with this, all these people is that they all were suffering horribly and they had no advice to give to the other person. They almost create a subculture 
uh, of hopelessness around this pool. And so if you can think about this, it was almost like, uh, uh, and they're all waiting for the troubling of the water. You know, this pool was a small place of healing in the midst of this nation. This nation basically was backslid, to be honest with you. They, you can tell by how they reacted to Jesus when he healed somebody. They would persecute Jesus and they'd persecute the person. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, they thought they said, we got to kill Jesus and we got to kill Lazarus. I mean, instead of, I mean, if you saw somebody raised from the dead, would you be a little bit impressed? I'd be like, wow, wow, what do you got? But they had the opposite approach. They said, we got to kill him, Jesus. We got to kill him and we got to kill Lazarus. That's how backslid this nation was. But even though in their backslidden condition, God left witness in that city that I'm still the healer. But it happened on a certain way. In other words, what would happen is an angel would come down or, or we don't know if it was an angel, but the Bible says it was an angel. An angel came down and stirred the water. And so there was kind of a cycle that went something like this. There were these loud cries of anguish and pain from suffering people. If you walked into that area where those five porches are, what you'd hear is loud cries of pain. People calling out, help me. And all this anguish because they didn't have like the painkillers that we have today. And then you'd hear that. All of a sudden you'd hear a, a collective gasp from the people. And then there'd be this mass scurrying around as people tried to get to the water. People running some people crawling, others being carried to the pool, followed by a shout of joy and praise and worship from the person who was there first. He got there first and suddenly, whatever sickness that he had, suddenly he was healed and he shouted with joy, I'm healed, I'm healed, which followed by cries of disappointment and discouragement from the other people. Then the loud cries of anguish and pain and suffering resumes with some chatter about how hopeless the situation is. And that's what you would encounter in that area if you walked into that area. And it was into this broken sea of humanity that Jesus came. Now, he only healed one man. Now, some people go, why didn't he heal everybody? How many have that question? Why didn't he heal everybody? I mean, that's what I would have done. I'd have gone in there and said, I'd have started, man, crippled people would have been jumping all over the place. Uh, people would have been being healed and jump. It would have been awesome. But he walked up to one crippled man, or we don't know if he was crippled, but he had an infirmity or weakness. We assume he was crippled and Jesus healed him. And then it says, if you keep reading, we didn't read this, but that he disappeared in the crowd and the crippled man didn't know who, who had healed him. But why didn't he heal everybody? You know, there's a, I don't know, to be honest with you, but there are some hints that you get from other stories. For example, in Mark chapter 8, we won't take time to look at this, but it says that he came, came to Beth. Here's another Beth. Bethsaida, which means house of fish. And they brought a blind man to him. Now, here's what's interesting. They bring this blind man to Jesus. How many know Jesus can heal blind people? They bring this blind man to him. But the Bible's, and they said, please heal this, this blind man. The Bible says that Jesus grabbed him, and the Greek word is very strong. It says Jesus seized him and dragged him out of the city, led him out of the city. And then when he got him out of the city, he put his hands on him, and he, said, and he took him away. He said, do you see? He goes, I see men as trees walking. In other words, the healing came partially. And then he laid his hands on him again. He said, now do you see? He goes, I see every man clearly. But he didn't perform the miracle in Bethsaida. He took him out of the city. Why did he take him out of the city? Because this was one of the cities that Jesus said, woe unto you. If the miracles that were done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. This was an atmosphere. This was an environment that resisted the supernatural. That's why Jesus took him out of the city. And prayed for him. And this guy had been in that atmosphere so much that when Jesus prayed for him one time, his healing didn't fully come back. It came back partially. Then he prayed for him again and his healing came back completely. And then he said this, don't go back into that city. Get out of there. 
If you go back in that city, you're going to end up blind again. See, atmosphere, whether we realize it or not, atmosphere affects the moving of God's power in miracles. That's why another place where Jesus, we see the same thing is where Jesus went into Jairus' house and he walks in and all these people are crying and sobbing because the daughter had died. And he goes, the daughter's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they ridiculed him. He said, get out of here. He chased them all out of the house. And he took Peter, James, and John, the mother and the father, went into the room, grabbed the little girl, said, I say unto you, arise. And the girl was raised from the dead. But he had to clear the house out. And he took Peter, James, and John. He took people that believed in miracles with him. And he said, let's do this thing together. But if I have the wrong kind of environment, it hinders what I want to do. That's why it said in, when Jesus came into his own hometown of Nazareth, it says he couldn't do any miracles there. Didn't say he wouldn't. He couldn't. Everybody say couldn't. couldn't. Except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people. Look at Mark chapter 5. And healed them. And then he said unto, unto them, he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about their villages teaching. Why? He's trying to get the unbelief out of people. And so it was, can you imagine walking into this environment not only are they struggling physically, they have a physical infirmity, but they are in trouble inwardly. They are they're so hopeless. They're in a hopeless situation. And they only have one ray of hope, and it's that pool. But in the case of this man, everybody got there ahead of him. And he never got healed. He was so discouraged. Jesus comes. The Bible says that this man had an infirmity. Infirmity means a weakness. The word is used for physical weakness, but it's also used for weakness of the soul. It's used for the inability to overcome corrupt things in our human nature, that kind of, that kind of a weakness. Or the weakness, the inability to produce some kinds of results or to overcome trials and troubles. That's the, word, the way the word is used. It's used both for bodily weakness, like a sickness, but it's also used for inward weakness, weakness of the soul. Now, in this case, it's clear this man had a physical weakness. But like I said to you before, that there are weaknesses inside that, we, that God wants to overcome. So here's my question. What weakness of body or soul do you have that you need the power of Christ to overcome? What weakness of body or soul do you have that you need the power of Christ to overcome? And you say, well, I don't have any. I'll tell you this right now. You have one weakness. You're a liar. <laughs> I've never met anybody that doesn't have something they need to overcome in their life, right? I, I need some strength where I need some power to overcome it. The Bible says that Jesus knew that this man had been in this condition for 38 years. And he asked the man, 38 years, think how long, that's almost like a generation. 38 years. How many here are not 38 years old yet? You're under 38. That means this guy was in this condition longer than you guys, I can't use that example, but longer than you guys are or longer than you guys are aged. I said that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> He'd been 38 years in this condition. And so this question is legitimate. He walks up to me and says, do you want to be made whole? You think, well, what is he doing there if he doesn't want to be made whole? Maybe his relatives wanted him to be made whole. They're tired of waiting on him. And so Jesus goes, do you want to be made whole? This is a legitimate question when you consider that how long he's been in this condition. See, here's what happens with conditions, conditions of soul, conditions of body. First, you have a condition. Then the condition has you. Let me just say it one more time. First, you have a condition. Then the condition has you. In other words, the condition, the weakness begins to define you. You see yourself. This is who I am. See, your past explains you, but it doesn't define you. Your past explains you, I'm this way, I got here because of my past. But going forward from this point on, it's going to be different. Amen. I was going to yell real loud there, but it's going to be different. Yeah. It can be totally different. Sometimes 
we have a condition for so long that we identify with it. And it becomes who we are. We say it. We see ourselves as a broken human being. We see ourselves in torment. We see ourselves as less. We measure ourselves by other people. We say, I'm less than that person because of something that this brokenness that happened to me. I remember I was, we were over at the Slacks on Friday night for a baptism. Yeah, we dunked them, a few people in the water. But Stan was telling me a story, and I think I had read this story about this gigantic elk. It's like a record elk. And I don't have all the facts of the story, but this thing had such a massive set of horns. It was unbelievable. But what had happened was it had somehow, I think it was jumping a fence or something, and its horns got hooked up in a bog, and it got tangled up so bad that it couldn't get free. I think it was a bog. Was it a bog? Something like a bog. And so it struggled and struggled for we don't know how long to get free from this bog. And a hunter came on it. And so the hunter called the DNR. He didn't shoot the elk. Now that's a hunter with self-control, if you ask me. <laughs> but he comes on it and he calls the DNR. And the DNR, they go out there and they do a rescue. And so they rescue this elk. Now I don't know how they did it, if they put it to sleep or whatever. And they rescued it, got it untangled from this bog. But the hunter noticed that the, the elk was suffering from having spent that time in the bog. And even though it was free and it was alive, it was still suffering from its time in the bog. And so the hunter watched it for several days and one day went out there and found it dead. Because it never recovered from its time, even though it was set free, it never recovered from its time being tied in that bog. And after I heard that story, I started thinking about, you know, that's a lot like Christians today as that we're sin is like a, an entangling agent. We get tangled up. We're like a trophy. The Bible talks about we're the trophy of God's grace and some Christian or the gospel did a rescue mission on us. And sometimes we never recover, even though we're free, we never recover from the time that we were captivated in the bog. I remember one time when I first got saved, I don't know why this story came back to me, but when I first got saved, we had this group. This is like 40 years ago. We had this group called God Squad. Yeah, God Squad. We'd pass out tracks. We'd have stamped on the back, God Squad. And we would do street witnessing down at Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis. And we'd go out every Friday night. Sometimes you have 100 people. We'd go out and invade the street. Yeah, we were the party poopers. Yeah, that's right. But we went out there and witnessed and passed out tracts. And I remember one time we were out there, there was this man, he had one arm. And we got him saved, got him spirit filled. We found out the way he lost his arm was he, he was a heroin addict. And he, he lost his arm shooting dirty needles. And his arm got gangrene and never, he never took care of it. So finally they had to amputate his arm right here. The night they amputated his arm in the hospital, he pulled all the plugs out of his body, wrapped his arm out, went out, went out uh, made a connection and shot up heroin that, that same night. He's totally addicted. And he got saved. Spirit filled. It was amazing. And he'd go around. I still remember him standing up and we'd be in coffee houses or, or different churches. And he'd stand up there and he, with one arm and he'd talk about how he was a hopeless drug addict. He was on heroin. He was so broken. And these street people began to witness to him how he got saved. And it was just so powerful. I mean, people were captivated by his testimony. And he went on for like a year. He was a part of our group. And one night we all got the news that they found him in a car with a needle in his arm. And he overdosed on heroin. He got free. But the effects of being enslaved in that situation, he never got out of the effects of being slave to that situation. You see, what has happened to you doesn't need to define you. It doesn't need, you don't need to stop your life, your emotional health, your emotional well-being doesn't need to stop there. You can go on 
And that's what God is saying to you today. I mean, I had serious problems when I got saved. But it's been 45 years. You say, well, what's going to happen the next 45 years? Well, if I live another 45 years, <laughs> it's, it's going to be serving Jesus and going all out for Jesus. Amen. Keeping the waters troubled inside. Because every time the water's trouble, healing occurs. Every time the water troubles, healing occurs. Every time the water troubles, healing occurs. Every time you read something or every time God speaks to you a word, it's like the water is trouble and healing will happen. Something will happen to you. I love the scene around the throne of God. I, I love this scene. And some of you might think, well, that seems boring where the angel that says night and day. They cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you go, after, after like thousands of years, aren't they getting tired of saying holy, holy, holy? It says they fly back and forth and they look and they go, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You know, you know what I thought about that? I think every single time they fly by, they see a new dimension of God. They go, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And they fly by and go, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You know that? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The earth. See, you have never touched the depths of what God wants to do in your life. You haven't even come close. You've barely scratched the surface of what God wants to do in your life and through your life and what you can do, what you can know about God. It's unbelievable. That's why when we have worship, I go, I just want to see you again. I want to pass by and see something I've never seen before and cry out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I want the waters to continually be stirred. Because every time the water is stirred, have you ever had, I hope this sermon, is this sermon stirring you up? This would be a good stirring, right? So, you, so the water gets stirred, and when the water gets stirred, something's going to happen. Healing's going to happen when the water gets stirred. Some part of your nature that has a weakness, has an inability to produce results, some part is going to be overcome by the water being stirred. And you're going to break into a new dimension of life. Something supernatural is going to happen to you. Because the most powerful thing is they had to go to a little pool in the city of Jerusalem. But our Savior, our Redeemer, our Healer is not, not uh, kept there in that little pool. He is on the loose on planet Earth. That's what I was trying to say. Sometimes a word, I hear a word, just doesn't come out of my mouth. But he's loose. And I like that about Jesus. He walked up to that guy. He goes, you don't got to wait for that pool. Here, listen to this. I'm a pool. I'm a, I'm a reservoir. Here, watch this. Get up. Pack up your bags and get out of here. And then he walked through and he went to somebody else. Get up. Pack up your bags and get out of here. And then he went to somebody else. And the day of Pentecost, that same spirit fell upon the early church. And they went everywhere saying, get up. Pack up your bags and get out of here. <laughs> Amen. That was good preaching right there. I'm glad I said that. Oh, volume always helps, doesn't it? What did he say? Yeah, you, didn't, you heard that. But I think that's a legitimate question. Do you want to be made well? Amen? That means you have to get up. You can't, you can't stay here anymore. You can't stay by this pool. You can't stay with these people. They're all hopeless. They're, they think hopeless thoughts. If you stay here, you'll die. You've got to get up. Get up. That water may not be moving, but this water's moving. Get up. I heard Smith Wiggle. I didn't hear him, but I read that he would say this. He said, if the spirit don't move me, I move the spirit. Amen. Amen. I know some, one time, you know, I was thinking, boy, I'm just, I prayed, God, give me an open door to witness to somebody. Give me an open door to witness. Somebody. I'd meet people. I go, I'm, I'm sitting like this. Is this it? Is this an open door? Is it? Finally, I go, I don't think I'm going to get any open doors. So I said, I'm just going to have to kick the door open. So I go, hi. <laughs> I just kicked the door open. How are you doing? I, one time I asked them, are there any good churches in this town? 
And the, and the guy goes, I don't know, the one I go to stinks. I go, oh, really? <laughs> then they start talking about the Lord, the things of God. But anyway, so my point is, sometimes you got to stir yourself up, right? Well, I'm going to skip down, close, bring this thing to a close. As we close here, so the first step, let me tell you one more story that's so, so important. I don't know, I've probably said this before. How many remember the story of the madman of Gadara? Remember that story? I used to call him Crazy Fred. If your name's Fred, no, no insult whatsoever. But Fred's not a very common name, so I use Fred. But, so it's like Crazy Fred. And it's, the story's pretty funny. There, there, he, he, he is this guy that's totally demonized and says that he, that he lives in the tombs or the graveyard, among the tombs. It says that he spends his time night and day crying and cutting himself. And the and graveyards in that day, just like Ashby, the graveyard, you can throw a rock from the side of town and hit the graveyard. I mean, it's very close. And so the tomb, the graveyard was right by the town. And Crazy Fred lived in the graveyard. And he wore no clothes. That's, that's right there would traumatize you. He wore no clothes. He cut himself, cried day and night. They tried to catch him and put chains on him. Clothes on him, put chains on him. He broke the chains. The guy's got Samsonite or Samson strength. Not Samsonite, Samson strength. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. If I said there was a guy living in the graveyard by Ashby, he could break chains, wore no clothes, night and day he cut himself and cried, would you, now you have a car, so you can get away fast. But let's say you didn't have a car, you have, you're on foot. Would you be afraid? I would be. I'd be like, let's go on the other side of the town. Let's not go by the graveyard. Crazy Fred's there. He breaks chains with his bare hands. He doesn't wear any clothes. That my sal- in itself would traumatize me. But he cuts himself and he cries night and day. I don't want to be by him. And so it says that Jesus comes into that area and crazy Fred comes out of the graveyard and Jesus casts the demons out of him and heals his soul. And the crazy Fred ends up fully clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus worshiping. It says the whole town came out. Now get this, this, this blows my mind. The whole town comes out, sees crazy Fred clothed in his right mind. And this is what it says. They were afraid. I'm like, now you're afraid? You weren't afraid before? I'd be afraid before. But when they saw crazy Fred normal, it says they were afraid and they said, they were afraid. They said, Jesus, you get out of here. You know what that tells me? Is that people can be so adapted to dysfunction that they prefer dysfunction over normalcy. Isn't that wild? That's why we have to be careful that in our soul that we love, we love normalcy, not dysfunction. That we're not comfortable with dysfunction. So the first step is there has to be a willingness to let go. So, you know, it's interesting when you read this story, as I come to a close, the worship team comes. As you read this story, it says, it didn't say Jesus said to the man, be healed. He asked the man, do you want to get healed? And the Bible says that the very first thing he said was he made excuses. He said, I don't have any man. There's nobody around here cares about me. I think you'd call that kind of self-pity. Nobody cares about me. And then the other thing he said was, when I'm trying to get there, somebody steps in my way. In other words, somebody did something to me. Somebody always does something, gets there before I do. And so I never get to the pool. You know, it's like, like a lot of times we, we look at what has happened to us. And that we get stuck. It's like our antlers get stuck in the bog. And we're this trophy, this mag- magnificent beast. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, magnificent beast. We're this magnificent beast. <laughs> I gave you guys a chance there with your wives. 
you magnificent. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so I said that to my wife one time. She goes, I'm not a beast. But anyway, so, but, but their whole horns, <laughs> oops, their, we get stuck. We get caught somewhere. And sometimes, even though we get free, we never recover. That stays with us. And eventually we die. Our soul dies. Maybe we don't physically die, but our soul dies. Because that, they did that to me. They said that about me. They did that. And I'm not diminishing pain, buddy. I know, I know what pain, I probably don't know what your pain is, but I know what my pain has been. We all have a testimony about pain. But do not let the pain end your life. Here's what Jesus says to you. He didn't say, be healed. He looked at that man and he said, man, get up. Wow. He could have said, I haven't walked in 38 years. I can't get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Take up your bed. Why take up your bed? This will be your testimony. This will be your testimony. I once laid on this bed. I once was helpless. I once was blind. I once was lost. I once was without hope. I once was hopeless. This is my testimony. Get up. Get up. Get up. Take your bed. Walk. Your day of deliverance has come. Your day of deliverance has come in bondage any longer. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. This is your hour. This is the hour of your deliverance. Amen. You're not stuck. You're not to be stuck any longer. Amen. Get unstuck this morning. Someone goes, yeah, but my situation is so complex. Come on, get unstuck this morning. Get unstuck this morning. Get unstuck. Don't die from what happened to you. Don't let your soul die from what happened to you in the past. Don't let your soul die. Get unstuck. Come on, get unstuck. Get unstuck this morning. Pack up your bed and start going forward. Get unstuck this morning. Let's sing this song together and we're going to pray at the end.
us lift up our hands right now. Hallelujah. 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 Let God invade every broken part of your life right now. Let God invade every weakness that you have, every weakness in your soul right now. Let God invade it. Everywhere there's a lack of strength, a lack of ability, let God, let the God that heals Jehovah Rapha, let him heal right now. Let him heal the brokenness, every broken part, every broken memory right now. Let him heal it. Let him open your soul up. Let fresh, fresh life come. Let fresh life come right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let him step out of the pages of this book, out of the pages of this story, and let him walk right into your life right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for new life. Thank you for new life. Hallelujah. Thank you for new life. Hallelujah. Thank you for new life. Thank you for a house of mercy, Lord. Thank you for a house of grace, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise. 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 Honor. Adoration. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God's good. Amen. You know, sometimes we are our worst enemy and God's trying so hard to bring us out. But sometimes we fight so hard to stay in one of those porches among the people that are broken and hurting. But God wants to take us out. Some of us feel like the mistakes that we made in the past, our life's over. That is a lie. Or something that happened in our past has defined us and our life is over. That is a lie. Don't let your time stuck in a bog define the rest of your life. Amen. Get up. Get up. Pack up. Get going. Amen. Man, that's a good message. You, you didn't have to clap, but God's talking to you. Praise God. God's talking to you this morning. I'm telling you that right now. We want to pray for you. Do you have anything? Nothing? like there's someone here who was abused by their father and because of that abuse it's hard to relate to a heavenly father and so if that's you if you just come on up after when pastor steve dismisses i'd love to pray for you because until you get to know your heavenly father and it's hard to relate when you didn't have a good earthly father and so either you've been abused or maybe he just wasn't even that wasn't there for you and so it's hard to relate. Praise God. I ask the prayer counselors to please come at this time. We're going to have you prayed for. If you need prayer this morning, you feel stuck. Something in your past is trying to define your life, trying to define your forward motion. You just need prayer. Somebody to pray for you, lay hands on you, pray that God will minister to you. One of these prayer counselors would be love, love to pray for you. Amen. Just remind you once again, the kids will be watched for another 25 minutes and then they're, they're yours. But if you want to go get them, you can go get them right now if you want. But that's, that's the plan right now. Amen? But if you have a need in your life, you, you feel stuck, you can't get over something, this is a great opportunity to be prayed for. Amen? The presence of God is here. The atmosphere is charged. It's ready. It's waiting for you. Amen? Praise God. Lord, I just thank you for this people now. We just pray, God, that you meet every need, Lord. Let this message permeate their thinking this rest of this week, Lord. Let them never forget it, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you, everybody. You're free to go. If you need prayer, please come forward.